welcome to an exciting journey to the pyramids, to the temples and royal tombs of Egypt. I've been with Francois to most of these biblical archaeological sites, and there is only one word to describe it. Amazing. My name is André, and I know that you will enjoy our first audiovisual presentation in this series of the Ancient Civilizations. What a sight! And welcome to our exciting journey into the fascinating civilization of ancient Egypt. Brilliant architects of yesteryear invite you to admire their masterpieces of art. Many books have been written about the imposing and mystical Sphinx and Pyramids of Giza, and many more will be written. You are looking at one of the seven wonders of antiquity. During the course of this series, you are going to see a few more. Ordinary people like you and me are usually behind most achievements. A team of a hundred thousand laborers built this giant pyramid of Khufu. It took them twenty years to complete. Two and a half million blocks, some weighing fifty tons, were neatly stacked here. History tells us that Pharaoh Ar Moses became the first king to protest against the foreign rulers. This man, Pharaoh Amenhotep I, who completed the liberation, succeeded him. Archaeologists discovered this statue of his wife. When my daughter was small, she also had protruding ears, but we managed to keep them in place by the way we combed her hair. Somehow Mrs. Amenhotep's mother couldn't be bothered. From now on, Egyptian history becomes very exciting. The obelisk on your right hand belongs to Pharaoh Tutmosis I, and the one on the left to his daughter called Hatshepsut. This is how the Egyptian artists portrayed him. Tutmosis I began his reign in 1533 BC, the year when Aaron, brother of Moses, was born. Now, according to the biblical chronology of 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, Moses was born three years later in 1530 BC. Let us ask the Bible to fill us in on the story of this Pharaoh. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous. So the land was filled with them. Then a new king, that Moses I, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come. We must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. The hieroglyphic records tell us that Tutmosis I was the first pharaoh to introduce Semitic slave labor. This statement is in perfect harmony with the biblical account of Exodus chapter 1 verses 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born you must throw into the river, but let every girl live. In desperation the parents of Moses hid him in a papyrus basket amongst the reeds. And this is where Hat Shepsut, daughter of Pharaoh Tutmosis I, found the baby and showed him to her father. When I looked at her obelisk, I could hear her say, Daddy, look what I found. A little Hebrew baby boy. I think he is a gift from the gods. I'm going to call him Hapi Moses, which means taken from the Nile god, Hapi. Dad answers in a deep voice, Shepi, my dear. We will have to drown this little fellow in the Nile because he will be our enemy one day. Please, dearest Dad, spare his life. I'm convinced that Hatshepsut was instrumental in persuading a father not only to save Moses, 
but also to rescind the death decree on the baby boys. While you're looking at the obelisk of Father Tutmosis I and his daughter Archipsut, I want to tell you a secret about my daughter. But please don't repeat this to her mother. You know, she can ask me anything she wants to. And if her mother is not around, she will get it. Grandfather Tutmosis I wasn't much different from any other grandfather. He allowed his daughter to adopt Moses as her legal son, and I'm sure he spoiled this little step-grandson in the same manner as most grandfathers do. Come with me to Deir al-Bari, where Hatshepsut built this beautiful mortuary temple. It was here, as well as at Karnak, that Moses received his formal education. You are looking at the ruins of the university where Moses, regarded by many scholars as the greatest genius of antiquity, received his education. Acts chapter 7 verse 22 says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. He had a doctorate in Egyptian literature and knew the 2,400 letter hieroglyphic alphabet by heart. He also had a doctorate in science, art, medicine, warfare, etc. In our next lecture on the Amana period, I'm going to teach you how to read hieroglyphics. Before Tutmosis I died in 1508 BC, he decided according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24, that Moses was to succeed him on the Egyptian throne. But on one condition, Moses had to become a polytheist, that means a worshipper of all the gods of the Egyptian pantheon of gods. Moses had to choose between worshipping the God of Israel, Yahweh, who had power over life and death, or worshipping Osiris, which was only the symbol of death and life. His choice is recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 25 and 26. It says, He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Moses made the right decision. Instead of becoming the greatest pharaoh of antiquity, and subsequently, a dried-up mummy. He received a special resurrection according to Jude, verse 9, and even today is enjoying the luxury of heaven and the presence of the only true God. That Moses I had an illegitimate son who married his daughter Hatshepsut. Because Moses declined the offer to become king, he became the next pharaoh called Tutmosis II. After a brief reign of only four years, he died. Would you like to see his mummy? He is the middle one. More than 3,500 years ago, those very lips spoke to Moses, and those very ears listened to the voice of Moses. Like his father, Tutmosis I, that Moses II also had an illegitimate son, so dads, be very careful. You learn much about Hat Shepsut, the stepmother of Moses, when you visit her mortuary temple. She was a creative builder who erected many temples throughout Egypt. She also sent trade expeditions to distant countries. Do you notice the donkey? This relief says she became a prominent and respected international head of state. Her reign was marked by prosperity and peace. But peace did not continue for too long. The priests staged a revolution, forcing Hatshepsut to recognize the illegitimate son of a late husband as co-ruler. This young man, known in history as Tutmosis III, 
eventually became the greatest pharaoh who ever lived. By the way, he is also called the Napoleon of Egypt. During a festival procession here in the most holy place of this Karnak temple, Tutmosis III was elevated to the throne through the so-called personal intervention of the god Amun. I wonder if Moses witnessed this coronation ritual. It's very exciting to read about the ensuing tension in the palace between Hatshepsut and the cabinet on the one hand, and Tutmosis III and the priests of Amun on the other hand. Suddenly in 1488 BC, after 16 years of co-rulership, all official documentation concerning Hatshepsut ceases. Why? Ancient rulers were ostracized whenever they changed their religion. By the way, we haven't changed much from those days. I personally think that Hatshepsut could have sympathized a little too strongly with the Hebrew monotheistic religion, and this led to the cessation of all official documentation concerning her. But because she was such a powerful ruler, it took them another six years before they finally murdered her and all her officials in 1482 BC. And to show their utter hatred for her and for what she stood for, they even chiseled her beautiful pictures from the temple walls. Just look at this one. But in order to let you and me think that she served the Egyptian gods till the end, they saved this specific mural. Here she is depicted as drinking milk from the holy cow Hathor. At times you discover the truth of the Bible in the Egyptian lies. Actually, she died because she forsook the worship of Hathor and many other Egyptian gods. What happened to Hatshepsut's foster child Moses? while all this political tension prevailed. We will have to go to the Bible to fill us in on this. Acts chapter 7 verses 23 to 25 When Moses was 40 years old, that was in 1490 BC, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being ill-treated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Poor Moses, although educated in all the wisdom of Egypt, he tried to deliver Israel his way instead of God's way. And this is my biggest problem, doing things my way. How did Tutmosis III react when he heard that Moses had killed an Egyptian? Exodus 2 verse 15 says, When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. Moses fled into the Egyptian wilderness. He fled from fame to shame. He fled from security to insecurity, from a somebody to a nobody. And then this man of God despaired. Has it ever happened to you? Have you ever lost something which previously gave your life some real meaning? Although Moses gave up upon himself, God did not. Here in the university of hard rocks and hard knocks, God was preparing Moses to accomplish the greatest task ever committed to man, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. During the first 40 years of his life, Moses became a somebody. He acquired all the learning of the ancient world. And then during the next 40 years, Moses tried to become a nobody. In the University of Loneliness, he earned doctorates in patience, humility, 
and dependence upon God. During his last 40 years, God showed the world what he could do with such a man. Amongst the majesty of Mount Sinai, Moses wrote the most sublime poem known in ancient literature. Psalms 90 verses 13 and 14 says, Have compassion on your servants. He was thinking of his suffering brothers in Egypt and he writes, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Moses was looking forward to the morning of the deliverance of his people from the cruel night of Egyptian bondage. But he also looked forward to another morning when tears and pain will be no more. In Exodus chapter 2 verse 23, we read that Moses refers to the death of his beloved foster mother, Pharaoh during that long period, Moses writes, the king of Egypt died. He is referring to the 40 years he spent in the Sinai desert from 1490 till 1450 BC. Can you still remember when Hatshepsut died? It was in 1482 BC. Egyptian history says that aggressive military expansions began in all earnest after Tutmosis III murdered Hatshepsut in 1482 BC. I checked the dates which Tutmosis III gave at Karnak with the dates of the conquest of Megiddo and they are in perfect harmony. He conquered Megiddo in 1479 BC how many years passed since he murdered Hatshepsut? If you count carefully, you'll notice there are three. How did he, that's that Moses III, treat the Hebrew slaves? Exodus 2 verse 23 The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of slavery went up to God. God heard their groanings and was concerned about them. What sympathetic words! What a caring God! In my study of the history of Israel and Egypt, I discovered a God of love who cares about people who go through trying times. By the way, He cares about you. At Mount Sinai, Moses had an amazing revelation of the character of God. He writes in Exodus, Chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. It was the year 1450 B.C. God told Moses to go back to Egypt and tell that Moses the third, Let my people go. That Moses replied in all his haughtiness, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Exodus 5 verse 2 But you know what? God cared about cruel that Moses the third just as much as he cared about his Hebrew people. He wanted to save the Pharaoh just as much as he wanted to save his people. Through ten successive plagues, God revealed his superiority over the Egyptian gods. For instance, they worshipped the Nile and called it Hapi or Iru, but their Nile god disappointed them and turned into blood. They worshipped insects like beetles, but during the third and fourth plagues, these hojas really gave them a hard time. God was calling them to worship Him, the gracious Creator who cares for people. The Egyptians also worshipped animals, but during the fifth plague, these beasts 
all died. A god of love was pleading with the Egyptians to set his people free, but they refused and hardened their hearts. And unfortunately, they reaped the consequences of their choice, the curse of the ten plagues. When Egypt rejected God's saving love and persecuted his people, she ceased to be the world's greatest empire. And we will notice the same pattern in the history of Assyria, Babylon, and the rest of the ancient civilizations. May God help us to learn from their sad experiences. The greatest miracle of antiquity took place when God led his two million redeemed slaves through the waters of the Red Sea. According to the chronology of 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, this event took place in 1450 BC. The Bible also gives us the exact date when the Israelites celebrated their first Passover. It was the 14th day of the month of Abib, later called Nisan, which corresponds with our month of March. Three days later they passed through the Red Sea. This brings us to March 17, 1450 BC. When the cruel Tat Moses and his mighty officials realized that they had lost their slaves, they pursued them. Listen to what happened to them. Exodus 14, 26 to 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. The story of the Exodus is not recorded in the Egyptian annals. Why? Because they never reported any defeat. This was policy. But fortunately, archaeologists identified a pharaoh who died on that exact date, March 17, 1450 BC. Let me read you the obituary of Tutmosis III, written by his autobiographer, a man by the name of Amenendab which was recently discovered. Lo, the king completed his lifetime of many years, splendid in valour, in might and triumph, from year 1 to 54, the last day of the third month of the second season. He mounted to heaven, he joined the sun, the divine limbs mingle with him who begat him. Brestet, the great Egyptologist, converted the Egyptian date to our Gregorian calendar. Guess what? He died on the 17th of March, 1450. It corresponds perfectly with the biblical date for the Exodus and the death of the Pharaoh and his army. The Bible story of the Exodus, my friend, is not a myth. It's an historical fact. I told my friends who are relaxing in the waters of the Red Sea that the Exodus is a symbol of God's mighty power to deliver people from the most degrading kind of slavery. And if the Exodus is not an historical fact, then God's symbol of salvation is destroyed. And we desperately need these tangible symbols to remind us that He can save any enslaved person today. The humiliating death of the greatest pharaoh who ever lived was such an embarrassment that the Egyptians decided to conceal the scandal forever. They mummified and buried a man in this tomb who resembled the great king. 
And for 3,450 years they fooled the scholars of the world concerning the biblical truth about the death of this great pharaoh. But in 1973, Harris and Weeks did some x-rays on this supposed mummy of Tutmosis III and discovered that it was the remains of a man who died in his early 40s. The real king was much older because he ruled for 54 years. As I was visiting the Valley of the Kings, the burial place of Tutmos III, I was once more again convinced of the authenticity of the Bible. It is still the most reliable source of truth in circulation. But more than that, I've also discovered that the Bible is an inspired manuscript that can touch the lives of its readers in a very meaningful way if studied prayerfully. While I looked at the Egyptian god of Anubis in the tomb of Tutmosis III, I thought of the comfort that the Bible brings for comfortless, the hope it brings for those who feel hopeless, and for those who feel lost and overcome by feelings of guilt, it tells of a forgiving saviour. Archaeology is a science that keeps on seeking for lost and seemingly worthless pieces of broken pottery. And once they find these broken pieces of pottery, they glue them together. And scholars from all over the world come and marvel at the work of restoration. A thought came to me as I watched these excavated restored and burning oil lamps from the time of King David. You know, so many of us are buried beneath the sands of guilt and shame. Fortunately, Jesus Christ, the heavenly archaeologist, is ready to remove the sands of guilt and to restore our brokenness. He wants to light a new flame of hope in the darkness of our hearts. All he needs is our permission to do it. Please don't miss out on the gripping story of the rest of the 18th dynasty. You are going to meet the successor of Pharaoh Tutmosis III, a man called Amenhotep II, and hear about his negative reaction to the Exodus. You will also be introduced to his son, Tutmosis IV, and hear the story of how the Sphinx spoke to him on one occasion. In this Egyptian lie, we are going to discover the truth of the biblical account of the tenth plague, in which all firstborn males died. Another highlight of the lecture will be a life sketch of Nefertiti and her husband Akhenaten with their daughters called Mekitaten, Meditaten, Neferneferuaten, and their third oldest daughter called Ankensenpaten, who married Tut Ankaten. And they all lived at Aketaten, and you'll discover what the meaning is of A T E N. So if you plan to divorce your husband or your wife, please wait till after you've attended the next lecture, because you're going to discover an ancient recipe for a happy family life. I'm also going to show you one of the most amazing discoveries made at Tel El Amarna. It gives a simple formula on how to enjoy a happy, meaningful family life. It also provides you with some excellent advice on how to raise children. There will also be some good news for those who are single. The formula also tells you how to establish a good relationship with those around you. God bless you till we see you again. I'm sure you have enjoyed part one on the pharaohs of Egypt. You cannot afford to miss part two. I invite you to come and enjoy a dazzling display of Egyptian wealth and gold that was discovered in 1922. But you will also discover the gold of the Bible's marvelous plan for a more meaningful and happy life.